Hey guys, welcome back to Monday. Hope you guys are having a good day so far. Today we're going to be finishing out our Unit 3 notes by talking about chemical bonding. So we've used the word bonds, atomic bonds, chemical bonds a little bit in class, but we haven't actually gone through and defined what it meant yet. So we're going to talk a little bit about chemical bonding and some different types of chemical bonding. We're going to talk about two in particular, covalent bonding and ionic bonding. First, we're going to start by defining what a chemical bond is. So a chemical bond is a force that holds atoms together in a compound. So we're going to write that down, a force that holds atoms together in a compound. So we've talked about compounds, we talked about how compounds were two atoms bonded together. That bonding, that force, comes from atoms taking or sharing electrons. with each other. So one more time all together, chemical bonds are a force that holds atoms together in a compound, so it holds those atoms together to form a compound or a molecule, and that force comes from when the atoms take electrons from each other or share electrons with each other. So we're going to talk about covalent bonding first. So covalent bonds, we're going to do definition first, then we're going to talk about why covalent bonds happen or how they happen. We're going to talk about some characteristics of covalent compounds and then a couple of examples. We'll do the same thing for ionic bonding on the other side. So this chart that you should draw in your notes is going to be like a compare and contrast. We're going to have definitions for covalent and ionic, talk about why they happen and when they happen, characteristics for both and examples of both. So if you haven't already drawn this chart in your notes, you should do that now. Go ahead and pause the video and draw this chart. We're going to start with covalent bonds. So the definition of a covalent bond is a bond formed by two non-metals sharing electrons. So a bond formed by two nonmetals sharing electrons. We set up here that chemical bonds could come from atoms taking electrons or sharing electrons. In a covalent bond, those two nonmetals are sharing electrons. So two, thing, two big things you should take away from this definition. Covalent bonds happen between nonmetals only, and they are sharing electrons. So finish that definition, and then we're going to move down to why covalent bonds happen. So a covalent bond happens because you've got these atoms trying to fill their valence shells. If you remember from our notes last week, those valence shells are most stable. The atoms are at their happiest when you have eight valence electrons. But only the noble gases naturally have eight valence electrons. So how do other atoms get to eight? They can do this by sharing electrons or by taking electrons. So covalent bond happens when atoms trying to fill their valence shells, trying to get to eight, and they share their electrons with each other so that they can have enough. Okay, so we're going to write that down. So covalent bond happens when the atoms, the nonmetals, we're going to write that again, non-metals, that's important. Try to get eight valence electrons, which is a full shell. So they end up sharing electrons with each other so they can have enough. 
atoms, nonmetals, try to get eight valence electrons, so they share some of their electrons, so they have enough. Okay, so that's why it happens. A couple of characteristics, we are going to write three. So we'll go ahead and make three bullet points. So covalent compounds, when atoms form covalent compounds, they have a special name for that compound. We call it a molecule. So if you heard the word molecule before, what you're actually saying is two atoms with a covalent bond between them, or more than two atoms with covalent bonds between them. So covalent compounds. are called molecules. Covalent compounds are called molecules. Covalent compounds are poor conductors of electricity. They don't let electricity move through them very well. Okay, covalent compounds are poor conductors of electricity, and covalent compounds have low melting points. Okay, so three characteristics of covalent compounds, they are called molecules. They have a special name, we're going to underline that just so we remember it. Covalent compounds are poor conductors of electricity. They don't let electricity move through them. And covalent compounds have low melting points. All right. So last thing we're going to do when we're talking about covalent compounds is we're going to talk about some examples. So a good example of a covalent compound would be water, one of our favorite examples. So what happens when you have a water molecule if you remember, we said that water was H2O, which means it has two hydrogens, because H is the symbol for hydrogen, and one oxygen, mm -hmm. O is the symbol for oxygen. So what you have when you have an oxygen, that's my O right there, and then two hydrogens bonded together, they're sharing their valence electrons. If we think back to our group numbers and our valence electrons from the periodic table, oxygen has six valence electrons. So I'm going to write that down. Oxygen has six. And then each of our hydrogen atoms only has one valence electron. So hydrogen has one, but I actually have two hydrogens here, so I'm going to write it twice. Okay, so oxygen has six, hydrogen has one each, so if I added all of those up, I would have six plus one plus one gets us to eight, and eight is where we want to be. Okay, we want to get to eight. So if oxygen and hydrogen pair up with each other, they can get to eight by sharing their electrons. Okay. Another example of a covalent compound that you might think of, especially when you're thinking of the characteristics of covalent compounds, if you're thinking about low melting points, bad conductors of electricity, you might think of something like sucrose, which is another word for sugar. So sucrose is a much, much bigger compound than water is. So we said that water, H2O, two hydrogens, one oxygen. The formula for sucrose is C12, so 12 carbons, H22, so 22 hydrogens in every molecule of sugar, and then 11 oxygens. So like we said, much, much bigger. We've got 12 plus 22 plus 11 gives us 47 atoms in every molecule of sucrose versus three atoms in every molecule of water. So a much bigger compound.
but still held together by those covalent bonds, still held together by atoms sharing electrons with each other. Okay. Now we're going to move on to ionic bonds. So ionic bonds are a little bit different. Our definition for ionic bond is that it's the attraction between two oppositely charged ions. So if you look in the name ionic, you can see the word ion. Remember that an ion is a charged atom. It's either gained or lost an electron, so it has a positive or a negative charge. So an ionic bond is the attraction between two oppositely charged ions. So the attraction between two oppositely charged ions. And ionic bonds happen between a metal and a nonmetal. Okay, so we're going to write that as well. Happens between a metal and a non-metal. So let's take a second to compare the differences in the definitions between ionic and covalent bonds. So we said over here that covalent bonds happen between two non-metals. Ionic bonds happen between a metal and a non-metal. So if you ever were given an example and I asked, is this a covalent bond or an ionic bond? And you had your periodic table with you. You could look and you could see if there's a metal there, it's going to be an ionic bond because covalent bonds only happen between non-metals. Ionic bonds involve a metal and a non-metal. Covalent bonds only happen between non-metals. So what's actually happening here when we have these uh, ionic bonds? What happens is that the nonmetal takes an electron from your metal So your nonmetal takes an electron from the metal, and that's different again than covalent bond because now covalent bond they're sharing. They're splitting that electron between them. It's going around both atoms. But in ionic bond, that nonmetal is taking that electron from the metal. And when it takes that electron, if you take an electron away from something, that means that you have more positive charge than you have negative charge. So your metal becomes positively charged when it loses that electron. It becomes a positive ion. And that nonmetal that took the electron now has more negative charges than it has positive. So it's a negative ion. So we're going to write that down. The metal becomes a positive ion. I'm going to write plus ion. And the nonmetal becomes a negative ion or minus ion for short. Just make sure you know what those mean in your notes if you're going to write it like I'm writing it. You can write out the word if you want to. So if you think back to your previous um, science classes, what happens when you have a positive charge and a negative charge? Do they attract each other? Do they repel each other? Do they not attract each other at all? Do they just sit there? So if you think back to that, you think about opposites attract. So I've got two opposite charges. Those opposite charges want to stick together. So those opposite charges want to stick together. And that's how they form an ionic bond, okay? So a nonmetal takes that electron away, the metal becomes a positive ion, the nonmetal becomes a negative ion. Those opposites attract and they want to stick together. So a few characteristics about ionic bonds. We're actually going to have four for this one, so try and write small. So four characteristics for ionic bonds. They are stronger than covalent bonds.
And when we say opposites attract, they really attract it. They really want to stick together. They're stronger than those covalent bonds. They tend to have, ionic compounds have high melting points. So we said that covalent compounds have low melting points. Ionic compounds have high melting points. And it compounds have high melting points. Um, we also said that covalent compounds are bad conductors of electricity. Ionic compounds are, you might guess, it's the opposite, really good conductors of electricity usually. So ionic, I'm going to abbreviate compounds for space here, are good conductors. Ionic compounds are good conductors. And then last thing you might think of, ionic compounds usually make hard, brittle crystals. So covalent compounds, it's a little bit more flexible, but usually when you've got an ionic bond, it makes a hard, brittle crystal. And once again, brittle means it's usually easy to break. It's hard, but it breaks easily. Okay, so four characteristics of ionic compounds. They're stronger than covalent bonds. They have high melting points, good conductors, and they make hard, brittle crystals. And if we compare that to our characteristics of covalent compounds, it's almost the opposite, especially with conductors and melting points. I, uh, covalent compounds are bad conductors and have low melting points. Ionic compounds are good conductors and have high melting points. So that is a contrast, if I'm asking you to compare and contrast, between ionic and covalent bonds. Last up, we've got our examples of covalent and ion or ionic bonds. So we've already done our covalent bonds. We're going to do our ionic bonds now. So one example of an ionic bond would be something like table salt. And if you've watched through all of my videos, you know that I pretty much always use water and table salt as my two examples because they're really convenient. So table salt is made of a metal, sodium, that's an alkali metal, it's found in group one, and a non-metal, chlorine, which is a halogen, found in group 17. So we've got my metal in pink, we've got my nonmetal in green. That chlorine snatches an electron away from my sodium, so sodium doesn't have enough negative charges, it becomes positive, so there's a little plus sign right there. The chlorine becomes negative, so it gets a little minus sign next to it. And a positive charge and a negative charge are going to attract each other, so they form an ionic bond between them. Another example of an ionic bond that you might find in your kitchen would be baking soda. So baking soda also has a sodium atom in it, so it's another Na, another alkali metal, and it becomes positive because you've actually got um, a covalent molecule that's stealing away. So you've got this HCO3, hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. So you've got this whole non-metal molecule over here that steals away that electron from the sodium. So we've got metals in pink, non-metals in green. That, non er, that metal becomes positive when its electron is snatched away. This non-metal becomes negative because it has extra electrons now, and those positive and negative charges attract each other. They want to stick together. So finish this chart and take a second to look over. Try and find all the comparisons that you can between ionic and covalent bonds. We talked about a few of them and their characteristics. So some of their characteristics are opposite of each other. High melting points, good conductors versus low melting points, bad conductors. We talked about how covalent bonds share electrons. Ionic bonds take electrons. Covalent bonds are formed between two nonmetals. 
ionic bonds are formed between a metal and a non-metal, and that's actually really important, so I'm going to go ahead and underline that in my notes, just so that's really visible. So, covalent bonds happen between two non-metals, ionic bonds happen between a metal and a non-metal. So if I ever give you an example, and I say, is this a covalent bond or an ionic bond, look at your periodic table. Is there a metal there? Then it's an ionic bond. If there's no metals, if they're all non-metals, it's probably a covalent bond. All right, go ahead and finish up your notes. If you have any questions, feel free to ask in class or email me later. See you guys next time.